Hi guys. Today on the podcast, I have Anya Mains. She is an, an educator and a parent coach specializing in helping parents talk with their kids about sex and relationships. We need her. This is why she's on the podcast. I've had so many of you guys inquiring about this. She was a high school teacher for over a decade and Anya became intimately aware of teen struggles and how our current sex ed programs and parenting culture fail to give kids the, the skills they need to navigate adolescence safely. She hosts the annual Talking to Kids About Sex interview series and speaks publicly at schools, parent groups, conferences, and private events. Anya coaches parents privately and in groups, helping them build skills around feeling and defending boundaries, articulating sexual values, answering children's questions, and becoming critical thinkers about sex in the media. Um, well, hi, Anya. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. It's my honor. That is the official bio, but I'll tell you, um, I invited you here, and you know I invited you here because everywhere popping up around me in my private groups, in groups that I'm just like a member of on Facebook. I just was seeing people posting everywhere. How, when do you have the talk? How do you have the talk? What do you cover? There was so much like I was sensing um, a lot of confusion from parents, a lot of fear. Um, and I just started feeling, and I had been on your newsletter list for a long time. And so you are my go-to expert and resource. And the way that Anya and I connected was because I was just referring and recommending her. I was sending people her website whenever I'd see things in forms. Cause a lot of times I, I'm a connector, you know? And so I'm like, Oh, I'm not the expert on that, but here I have a resource. And so um, I had been silently referring you and you had no idea and then you caught wind of it and reached out to me <laughs> that you're like who is this person <laughs> I need to know this lady <laughs> who's so funny me? <laughs> yeah so yeah, funny and for that. and I love that you bring the teacher perspective you know you you know I almost feel like it's like you're unbiased because you're a mom of a young child but you worked with teenagers. And so you saw our teenagers in a different way than most of us see our kids. I mean, do you think that that's really helped you in terms of kind of becoming an expert on this topic is that you really get the kids perspective? Well, I think so. And I think there's a piece around skill building that teachers understand that perhaps the average person who's gotten their PhD in human sexuality or even in therapy and counseling, who's like a marriage and family therapist, maybe they don't have that educational lens the way that I do where I'm like, okay, what are the baby steps to actually build this skill? Because parents are missing skills and kids are missing skills, right? Mm -hmm. And so on both sides, how do we build up the parent skills at answering questions or at leading conversations? And how do we build up the kids' skills, say, boundary skills, right? Or it could be that critical thinking skill so that when they're looking at porn or they're looking at a Victoria's Secret ad, they know right away, hey, man, that's not real. You know, that's not a real body. That's not real sex. And so how do we skill build? That's really my interest. And I think that that lens has been missing. That's interesting. Skill building. And it's really skill building in terms of let's build some skills so we're not scared of this conversation as adults, as parents. And, um, and ultimately, our goal is to help our children build the skills so that they're able to make good choices, responsible choices, choices that are going to keep them safe emotionally and physically. Yeah? Absolutely. And it's not anybody's fault that you don't have these skills right? It's just a gap. You know, our society is hypersexualized and yet sex silent. So of course you didn't grow up learning how to talk about this. It wasn't modeled for you. It wasn't modeled for me, you know? And so if it's not modeled for us, then we don't naturally absorb this skill. Or maybe it's something like consent culture as opposed to rape culture, right? Mm -hmm. We've had this whole Me Too movement. And so consent is a whole set of skills 
it's being able to read the other person, it's having the self-restraint to ask and then wait for the answer and not just feel like you get to reach out and hug somebody or you get to reach over and just kiss your partner, right? Because it, when we're not modeling that for our kids, our kids are like, oh, I don't have to wait. I can just hug whomever I want. I can just kiss whomever I want. And then we get what eventually comes from that and we go, ah, how come we don't understand about consent? Well, it's never been modeled for us. It's never been in our families, not really. And there's a lot of coercion in our families. So how do we go back and start over again and build this thing from scratch? Gosh, this is so interesting and good. And I just recorded a podcast um, I just recorded a podcast that is going to come out, I believe, the week after this podcast. Um, and so, cause, so I kind of did things out of order, um, but it was really about rape culture and all that brought was brought up by the Kavanaugh case. And so, so some of these terms are new for many of us, right? Like rape culture versus consent culture. And, um, and I would love for you to kind of, define those two like you just kind of defined consent culture can, can we just like put a definition so that we're super clear and we really help people to understand the differences yeah absolutely so when i think of rape culture and you know i'm not pulling up the definition that i use when i need it at my fingertips um so i'm unprepared but when i think of rape culture what comes to my mind is a culture where it's almost a foregone conclusion that there's going to be some kind of sexual assault or harassment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just in the culture. It's the way that we live. We know that a high percentage of kids, right? Girls, boys, any gender are going to be sexually harassed. We know a high percentage of adults are. And so it brings in this, uh, this fear that how you behave, how you dress, how you do your life could possibly make you vulnerable because this thing is in the culture, as opposed to the opposite assumption, which is mm -hmm. that it doesn't matter how you dress and it doesn't matter how you behave because there's so much respect everywhere. How would anybody even think to take advantage of you? Mm -hmm. They would, of course, ask before doing that or know that if you weren't enthusiastically on board with what they wanted to do, they wouldn't do it, right? And so it's like, if you're scared to death of your child wearing a crop top or red lipstick, that's because of rape culture, right? If mm -hmm. you knew that your child could wear a crop top and red lipstick or short shorts and that it wouldn't matter, that they wouldn't be getting unwanted attention, that they wouldn't be becoming vulnerable, if you felt safe wearing whatever sexy thing and being as vibrant as you wanted to outside, mm -hmm. then that's consent culture because you know that you're gonna be respected, that it doesn't matter what you're doing, you're still going to be asked for your consent. So we're really, that's the world we're fighting for. <laughs> we're, I think we're, so. Mm -hmm. In that's my mind, I think fighting. so. That's the, and when we're preparing our kids to be part of the solution and we're raising them, um, with the values of consent culture, right? This kind of segues into the, how do we talk to our kids about sex? When do we start the conversation? Because that's the point of all of this, right? We're create, we're having powerful, productive conversations in our households, right? They're ongoing and we want to raise kids where they are part of the solution. We are part of the solution. Yes, there has been this rape culture that many of us didn't even realize was going on and we were accessories to. I, that's part of my, th my podcast was like, I read this article on Facebook about 16 Candles, the movie 16 Candles, and all of the rape culture nuanced messaging. Oh, and, yeah. I, and I was like, okay, well, brick to the head, I feel like an idiot. You know, and um, and I think I've been an accessory to rape culture in the 80s. If I think back to the parties that went on and, you know, I mean, I, I was I felt guilty. I felt um, stupid. I felt like I felt ignorant. Oh, and we've so, all done it. We've mm -hmm. all done it, especially in our teen years. You know, I had a boyfriend, my first boyfriend when I was 13 in eighth mm -hmm. grade. 
And mm -hmm. as many adolescent girls are, I was more mature, more developed, more sexual than he was. And at some point, you know, months into having held hands and talked on the phone, I decided it was time for us to have our first kiss. Did we have a discussion about this? No. <laughs> I decided it was time and I had absorbed this idea that boys want sex, right? And so whatever you throw at them, they'll want. And so I assumed that he would want this. And so I just made the move, right? I leaned in to kiss him goodbye on my porch and he ducked. <gasps> That was not consent, okay, right? Like that was a big, whoa, okay, I guess I should have talked to you about this. And Josh, wherever you are, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's such a good story. That is such a good story on so many levels. Because I love that it was all, like I'm now sitting here thinking I'm a mom of two boys and a girl. And I am my boy, my, all my kids, but my boys have been a little late to hit puberty. And, um, and so I'm thinking about my seventh grade, 12 year old son. And I just asked him the other day, actually on a walk last night, after I did this podcast, it's in my mind. I started talking to him about some things and he looked at me on our walk and he goes, this conversation is making me very uncomfortable. <laughs> That's what he said. And I said, okay. I said, I get it. Um, I said, and he, I said, I said, I get it. And it is important to have these types of conversations just because the time will be here at some point. And I just want you to know that these things do go on and I don't want you to be hearing about them first from other kids. And you know, as an 80 pound 12 year old boy, where I see at these bar mitzvah parties, like the girls are towering over, so a lot of the boys have hit puberty. I know he's probably not going to hit puberty till he's 15, like his brother. Um, he's far away from that. So if all of a sudden he had a little girlfriend in eighth grade and she was like, in her mind, she's thinking, I'm going to give him what he wants. I want to kiss him. Of course he wants to kiss me. I don't need to ask for consent. And she leaned in to kiss him. He'd probably be the ducker. Yeah. You know, like. So. Oh yeah. No, I was way off track, but nobody had ever had this conversation with me. Nobody mm -hmm. ever said you don't know what somebody else wants just because mm -hmm. you want it, right? This is where the golden rule totally fails us. You mm -hmm. can't just assume that about somebody else. And when it comes to touch, all touch needs to feel good to both people. And so you don't know if that's going to feel good to somebody else. The only way to find out is to ask, truly. Mm -hmm. We misinterpret mm -hmm. body language all the time. Mm -hmm. So do you have that conversation with your kids when they start to like, have boyfriends and girlfriends and 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 do you flat out say so if you do want to kiss another person you need to say may I kiss you like yeah. do you say do you role play that a little bit do you say that I mean yeah I think it's a, a super important message to give that mm -hmm. you have to do the verbal ask um, mm -hmm. you know runner up to that is to like lean in and not totally go for it you know, so if you go half the distance and then the other person would consent by going the other half of the distance, but that's sort of coercive, right? The other mm -hmm. person, girl or boy, may feel like they have to, to not mm -hmm. disappoint you, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's way better to ask because it shows so much more respect and so much more mm -hmm. care. And then, mm -hmm. of course, we have to be ready for whatever answer we get. And that mm -hmm. might be the tricky part, right? Because we love getting an enthusiastic yes. I mean, just imagine how wonderful and warm and gushy that moment would be when someone's like, yeah, right? That is awesome. And so really relish the yes. And what we're scared to death of is the no. Mm -hmm. And if someone's like, no, 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 right? Then how do you get out of that awkwardness, right? How do you recover so that it, again, it's smooth because a lot of people feel like, oh God, the date just ended, right? We just broke up because I asked to kiss her and she said no, and there's no recovery or vice versa, right? Her and him or him and him or her and her, however the gender pronouns work out. And so the, the safe recovery from a no, the really graceful thing to do is to role play with our kids, yes, and give them a script. Something like, I'm so glad you told me because I like you so much and the last thing I want to do is make you uncomfortable. Oh, brilliant. Everyone rewind yeah, that like 10 right? times. Yeah, 
everyone rewind that 10 times because that's it. Those are the words. Like when, you, because it's so vulnerable to feel shot down like that, to put yourself out there, to put your heart out there on the table and then to feel like somebody stomped on it, but maybe they didn't stomp on it. They just felt uncomfortable. They weren't ready. And they're actually, they have respect for you in a way that they're going to be honest with you. And, and, you know, and I think that giving our kids that script and role playing that a little bit and letting them know, like, and, you know, I'm big on these productive conversations, but I think one of the best ways to do it is to infuse a ton of empathy through our own storytelling and sharing our own experiences and um, like my kids, use, my teenagers use the term cringy all the time. Like when you have one of those awkward moments, they're like, oh my God, so cringy. And so I'll say, you know, I, if I'll say, oh my gosh. And I remember being there. My husband loves saying, you know, like Brenda Sullivan in fourth grade, you know, he loves bringing up people's full names, but like to use one of those names that they're never going to recognize and to say, I'll never forget in seventh grade when I went to kiss Brenda Sullivan and she all of a sudden needed to look away and look at a bird up in the sky. And it was just so uncomfortable and so awkward. I wish somebody would have taught me to say, you know, it's, I think that can also feel a little bit, um, it, it can, it can be an easier way for our kids maybe to hear us. Cause they're just listening to a story. They're hearing a vulnerable share They're It's, it's kind of more comfortable. We're not actually in teaching mode. We're just sharing some hilarious, awkward, cringy story from when we were their age. Right. Right. And so this is one where we can do it almost like a, a choose your own adventure. It's like, mm. okay, here's the ending it had in real life. Here are some other ways it could have gone. Which one do you think would have been the best? Right. 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 If you could go back in time and do it for me, how would you do it? So good. So good. Um, yeah, I love that. So tell, okay, so let's start talking about the sex talk talks. I know you're going to say sex talks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah it's not just one, but there definitely is like a starter talk that raises a lot of fear inside people. So there are things that we do from the very beginning, like naming your anatomy or, you know, starting to teach about private parts, you know, or uh, what's private versus what's public. And so there's things that we do that actually fall under the umbrella of sex talks, but that's not the one you're asking me about. I'm pretty sure you're asking me about how do we explain sex and conception? Yes. Yes. And, and like, what's your advice in terms of what's the right age? Do you wait and follow their lead? Um, like, do you keep it super sciencey? Yeah, yeah. I just would love like your top. I mean, look, I know you, um, you have talks and products that, that people can purchase that walks, that hand holds people and walks them through this entire process. Right. Yeah. Yeah, no, okay. I'm, I'm totally happy to share it with you. Yes, please. Right now, like just while everyone's here so that they can grab a pen and they can rewind it. And we're going to, of course, put all this in the show notes. If somebody is like, oh, the talk, what are you talking about talks? What do you mean the anatomy? What? And they're feeling all kinds of fear right now. They're the person that would be a perfect fit to buy that product from you. So let us know how they can find it and how they can get it. Oh, sure. I can do that too. But let's answer your first question so that you have an idea where I'd take you. So there are those initial conversations that you can do first, which are super protective, right? So we teach the proper names of the anatomy and we teach private parts and all of that because we want to prevent sexual abuse. Explaining sex and conception is as preventative and as powerful is doing any of those other things. Because when we explain what sex is, then there's no mystery around it, kids get it. You're like, oh, that's what it is. And we get to say, this is something for an adult body, it's not for kids. And so right there, we've created a boundary that didn't exist before. And so kids tend to be too innocent. You know, if somebody wants to take them down that path, if they have ill intentions, the child is like, I don't know any better. 
right? Nobody's ever told me about this path. I'm kind of curious about it. What are you doing? Nobody ever does this, right? Mm -hmm. And so when we don't have the talk, we actually leave them vulnerable. Mm. By having the talk, by explaining what sex is, you actually get a chance to say that kids' hearts and minds and bodies are not ready for sex. That these private parts of your body are sacred and just for you. And that when you're an adult, you'll be ready to share them with somebody else. But right now, children are not ready. And so it is not okay. And if anybody ever tries to see, touch, take pictures, videos, or any of that stuff, then that person's making a mistake. And that person might need some help. And so I need you to come tell me, right? So we get a chance to say all of these things just by being brave and engaging in that conversation, which means that doing it earlier is better. So I recommend that we have the talk with our kids at age five. And a wow. lot of parents feel like that's really young. Mm -hmm. And it's because they don't need to know at five. No, they're probably not sexually active, right? A lot of parents think they don't need to know until they're going through puberty, right? Because that's when I could protect my daughter against getting pregnant, right? That's where the parents' fears are. But when we're talking about preventing sexual abuse, preventing Me Too stories, uh, it's much better to do this a lot earlier. And then of course, if you started at five, you have all that time between five and 10 to be having conversations. Mm -hmm. And if you start at 10, you've lost five years and you still have to have all the conversations, mm -hmm. but now you're trying to play catch up with, you know, uh, an adolescent who may not be as open to it. So if we exactly. normalize it young, if we make it no big deal, we're like, hey, you know, I just want to explain to you where babies come from because I don't think you know that yet. Here's a book. We read mm -hmm. books all the time. Let's read a book together, right? Because there are books on this for four and up. And so you don't even have to be that creative, right? You don't have to be coming up with analogies or trying to figure out what to say about storks, you know? Mm -hmm. You can actually just read a book with your kid and answer their questions mm -hmm. and be sensitive to their boundaries. You know, if they get uncomfortable, mm -hmm. you say, oh, let's put the book aside. You know, we've done enough for today. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so back to, because I know people want this resource. Um, I'm not just like, I'm not plugging your stuff here. I'm really actually wanting to give people the resource of how to start having this talk, how to ha start having this talk with a five-year-old, what it looks like as they grow up. So just quickly tell us, like, how do they, how do they get this resource from you to really walk them through it? Oh, well, I have a webinar called Birds and Bees and Beyond, and that's for parents of kids zero to eight. I have okay. other webinars for parents who have older kids. So, you know, maybe you have five kids in your family and you are interested in all the webinars. But if you just have a little one, then really the three topics that you need to work on before eight years old are preventing sexual abuse and boundaries and consent and having this initial talk so that your kids are as protected as possible and as grounded in their bodies and, and know what they're allowed to say, right, about their feelings and their boundaries so that they really are as protected as possible. So the Birds and Bees and Beyond webinar, I think it's $27 on my website. It's just a recording. So if you wanted to purchase it, you'd get access to that and you can watch it as many times as you want. Yeah, I'm going to put a link to that in the show notes because this is the other thing I was just thinking of is in terms of skill building, right? So I teach how to have a productive conversation and, um, and really it's how to have a productive conversation about anything, but really so much of this is skill building. So if we start having the, if we start practicing the big talk with our kids when they are five, talking about boundaries and consent and I mean, all of these amazing topics, okay? And we're basically having this arena for practicing how to have a productive conversation, how to have open communication with our kids. And we're just going like full Monty from the get-go. We're going to the talk. Can you imagine if you've been talking about the big thing since they were five, what the conversations are like when your daughter or son is 15? Oh, exactly. Right? It puts you in a whole different realm. 
because this is normal for your family. You've always been talking right. about this stuff. Right. Like we've been talking about sex forever. We've been talking about consent and boundaries and all kinds, you know, sexual abuse and okay touching and not okay touching and, and how to, you know, how to feel the sensations of our body and what sensations are good sensations and what sensations are creepy sensations for a reason. Like all of these things, this is skill building that impacts our lives and our relationships forever. And so, I don't know, I just kind of got a light bulb moment because I was like, this is the perfect way to skill build and become a productive communicator and really build such rich connection with your kids in a way that's going to truly keep them safe in the world. Yes. Believe it or not, these conversations bring you closer. Right? People are afraid that it's not going to go well, that it's going to create distance and conflict, that it's going to be really scary and awkward. And it's kind of the opposite because especially mm -hmm. if you start young, your kid can shake off a lot, you know? And so if you're starting early, you're getting a lot of practice with saying the words or having the conversation or looking at the book. And so you're getting more comfortable with it and they're kind of oblivious. Now you try this with a 13 year old who is like onto you right? If you're uncomfortable at all, they'll be like, I don't want to do this. This is uncomfortable, right? This freaks me out. This is not right. You know? And so the longer we wait, actually, the harder we make it for ourselves. As oh my gosh. It's so funny when you have multiple kids, like we've had three different experiences and exactly what you said with our oldest son, we didn't know. And so um, when he was like 12 or 13, my husband went in and, get, and had the talk. He read a book you know, my husband like prepared for it. He's a major fact finder. So he like studied and prepared and he needed to go and have the talk with his oldest son. And he went in and I was like, you can do this. You can do this. And he went in <laughs> and he, and next thing you know, it was like 10 minutes later and I heard a door slam and I heard my son like yelling, like, get out. <laughs> and my and my husband like came back and he was like head hung low. He was so sheepish, and he was like, "You asked me to do one thing, <laughs> like one, like handle one thing, and it was a miserable, massive fail." And I was like, "It's okay, it's okay." And it was just—I mean, we laugh about it now with our son, who's twenty, um, but with his younger brother, this last summer he was about. Oh no. It was not this last summer, the summer before when he was starting middle school, we hadn't officially had the talk. I didn't know this yet. Um, but what I realize now is we've been talking about everything but the actual act for, you know, up, up throughout and throughout his life. So he was begging us for the talk. And he was like, will you guys please just tell me all the details? Like when, when will you tell me all the details? He was begging us and we ordered those, uh, what are those stork books? Yeah, the Roby uh, Harris series. Yes, Roby yes. We, an incredible author who wrote, it's so amazing, it's not the stork, it's perfectly yeah. normal. Yeah. Yes. So we ordered those books and we were, I was like, just wait for the books. Let's just get the books. And so we were all kind of laughing as a family because my older children are much older than him. And so he, we all, he's like all of our little one. And then my daughter, um, when she and I talked about it, I remember we had been watching Glee and it was, there was like some really sexual scenes and she was in fifth grade. And I was thinking she's going to middle school next year and I needed to teach her about oral sex and all these things. Like, and so I remember I was like, okay, we got to talk about some things and I, I'll never forget. We laugh about it now. I'm like, I wish there was ever a time I wish I had had a hidden video camera. It was during that conversation because when I told her, like she honestly did not know her jaw was on the ground. She was like, wait, you do what it goes wait, wait you've done that and then all of a sudden I saw her face and she goes you've done it with dad and I was like uh-huh and, and then like the next and three yeah. times yeah then the, she goes because wait you did it with dad three times and then I think it was the next day she was like let me ask you a question have you only done it with dad three times 
or have you done it with dad other times? And I was like, no, other times too. And she was like, oh my God, like, do you, are you like doing it every night? <laughs> she started asking me all these questions. And I remember I, I laughed so much and I said, wait, you're supposed to be the one that's uncomfortable here, not me. You're giving me the third degree. She's like, but I need to know this stuff. I mean, <laughs> so it was like three very different, three kids, three different scenarios and three different um, stages of parenthood for me and different skills, right? Like, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So if you aren't ready to do this at five, because you don't have your books all lined up, then <laughs> the deadline is eight. Okay. Because by eight, not a hundred percent, but most kids are going to school or interacting with other kids who know, which means that they are learning from those other kids, from their peers, or maybe even from the internet, which means you're not getting there first. And mm -hmm. I really want the parents to get there first and give accurate information right from the beginning and be the child's source. And so eight is your deadline. But then, of course, you've given up three years of conversations and three years of protection. Because in those three years, who knows what might happen that your kid doesn't understand sex is not for them or porn is not for them, right? Same mm -hmm. logic. So mm -hmm. when we're having this conversation and we go through the book, yeah, you know, I definitely recommend It's Not the Stork by Roby Harris. Then there's some other elements to bring into, right? It's not just the conveying of the, here's how a baby is made. It's bringing in some sex positivity maybe and saying, mm -hmm. hey, actually, I know that people say sex is to make babies, but most people have sex for bonding because mm -hmm. it's a really wonderful way for two adult bodies to feel good together, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so let's just come right out and let them know that it's pleasurable because mm -hmm. without that piece, there's so much in our world that doesn't make sense. Why would there be pornography, right? Why would there be sex and advertising? And so we can't start talking about those things until you let them know that it feels good. Right. You know? you know, then also may tie in with masturbation and some other conversations that you might need to have young because some kids start masturbating young. And so mm -hmm. it all folds together. Um, another piece you might tack on to this first conversation would be talking about porn and saying, hey, you know, people have taken videos and taken pictures of people doing everything that people do. Of course, there's pictures and videos of this too. And you might stumble across it on the internet just like sex is not for kids, those pictures and those videos are not for kids, you know? And so you can warn them. We can have a, the initial porn conversation and let them know what they're supposed to do if they stumble across it or if anyone ever tries to show it to them because that is a grooming tactic that abusers will use, try to show them mm. porn to, um, to expose kids. Uh, and I'm trying to think, anything else? Oh, you don't want your child to be a little sex pointer on the playground. So yeah. there's probably a boundary to put in place. So after you've talked to your five-year-old, your six-year-old, your seven-year-old, your eight-year-old, your 10-year-old, doesn't matter how old they are, it's important to say, you know, hey, this was a big conversation between you and me. And it should be that way for all kids. So it is not your job to go out and educate your friends. If they want to know about sex, tell them that's a big conversation to have with their mom or dad. Mm -hmm. That's so good. That's so good. And I think when you're proactive and you have this open line of communication, which builds so much connection, your kids, because I've seen this with my own kids, they, they won't be the sex flainers. They won't be the ones out there. And I did have the porn conversation with my kids young, because I remember when my daughter was in second grade, um, one of her friends um, a little boy actually had been at a house and seen oral sex on the computer. And, um, and, and I remember I was, I've always been a little nutso about um, technology parameters and um, really, really limiting access to technology, computer in the kitchen. So um, like I, you honored your boundaries around technology. Can I just yeah. say that rather than you're not so? Yeah, yeah, you could say it. Me saying I'm not so is, is me, um, is probably me being self-deprecated, but also me celebrating 
a little bit of that nothingness and my boundaries. It was really me having boundaries. But um, after that happened, I remember I was um, highly selective about where she went to play. Um, and I kind of equated it to when my son was little, I remember I, we live in Texas. So it's not, it's, it's very reasonable that our kids are going to go to somebody's house that might have a gun. And so I remember when, um, not that that doesn't happen outside of Texas, but we're in Texas. So, um, I remember when he was little, um, my boundaries at that time were, if he was going to go over anywhere for a play day, I was like, do you have a gun? And where do you keep it? Um, and that was a question. And I said, you know, I kind of feel like this technology thing should be like the gun thing, which is, um, do your kid, are your kids allowed access to the internet? Is it unsupervised? Where do they go to get on the internet? Like, these are not questions that we're asking, but if your second grader all of a sudden sees porn, like they can't unsee it. Exactly. You know? And so I remember having that conversation with my daughter because I was, I was like, you're not going to be going and playing over people's houses that have unsupervised access to the internet. And this is why, you know, you always have to explain the why, and this is why. And, um, and I said, and that's why if you are ever anywhere and there's something that comes on the computer that is confusing or scary or has naked bodies, um, it is not for you to see it is inappropriate and it will, it's not safe for your brain to see it at this age. So, um, so I need you to look away. I need you to walk away. I need you to get out of the situation and, um, and tell me about it. And, um, and I might've, I might've infused a little, especially with my daughter, a little bit of fear there because I think she was, and now, and my younger son, they both were, very scared to look at anything on YouTube on other people's um, devices because they weren't sure exactly what was going to come up. Cause I think I did accidentally put maybe a little too much fear there. Um, but we did have that conversation cause I was so scared of that. I was scared of it. Yeah. Yeah. And I get the calls from the people who didn't do that. The people are like, mm -hmm. okay, my four year old grabbed my phone out of my purse and I didn't know that he knew how to unlock it. Turns out he's seen me do that every day of his life. And so he knew what to do. And, you know, he was literally just randomly pressing buttons. You know, he wasn't searching for anything. Or there's the parents who are like, yeah, my kid was searching for something. They were searching for sparkly tights, but spelled it T I T S. You know, and so. Like, unfortunately, it's to the porn industry's benefit to target kids. And it's a little bit like the Joe Camel cigarettes. Like, why mm -hmm. would you have a cartoon camel selling cigarettes? That's not going to be super attractive to adults. That was to target kids. Same thing here. They are, you know, doing sex scenes with lightsabers so that when you search for lightsabers, that's what comes up right? And of course, a kid might search for lightsabers, right? And so unfortunately, you know, yeah, just surfing around YouTube, or even some of the apps, like musically, you can find porn in mm -hmm. on the internet in YouTube in musically, because it's there, you know, and, and they're trying to figure out how to reach kids, because kids will be confused by it will be interested in it, will click around. And if you can hook a kid young, then now you have a porn user for life, right? And so there's a relationship there because it's far more likely that a kid will start masturbating to porn and start wiring their arousal pathways in that direction than that a kid will not see porn or, you know, maybe see porn and push it away and go deep into their relationships and, you know, woo somebody and wire their arousal pathways in that direction. By the time they're adolescents, they know porn exists. They think it's the sex ed that we're not telling them. They're curious about how to do exactly all the things, you know, and so they want to know what rimming is. They want to know what 69 is. They, they don't just want a verbal explanation. They want to see it done, right? And so they get all the wrong messages from porn, as we know. It's so scary, and it's so addictive. I, I heard a story, like a chilling story that stuck with me um, a year or two ago. And it was someone who their six-year-old had a television in their bedroom, five or six-year-old, 
and they didn't realize they had access to, you know, Skinamax or Showtime or one of those. And for six months, the child was obsessively watching porn. And so now we've got, you know, six months. I mean, kids are like at that age, their brains are developing like it's like puppy years, right? Like so much development in six months. So he literally, by the time they figured it out, it was almost like he was now hardwired for that addictive thinking. And it, there was, it was so shocking and scary. And, um, and I was like, well, if that isn't right there reason to say no devices, no technology in the bedrooms unsupervised, like hardwiring them. It's like what you said, you got a porn user for life, you know? I mean, it's so scary. It well, really is. Some people really like using porn. Some people are porn, porn users by choice. They had a perfectly normal development and then they- As adults. Out, as adults. But as, Right. And then they like porn. And so I don't want to say that it's porn necessarily that is the problem. But I do want to say that there's so much misogyny and violence and, you know, just inaccurate information about sex in porn. And I think that's really the problem. You know, if porn was essentially what it used to be, which was pictures of normal bodies and normal people having normal sex, I don't think that would be nearly so damaging. And it's what it has become as it's gotten more and more extreme, as you know, softcore porn became the normal advertising on the street, and hardcore mm -hmm. porn became the common normal porn online. And as kids started accessing that, then they're wiring their arousal pathways in more of an abusive direction, right? Where it's seeing men dominate women that's arousing. Now that scares me, right? Because well, what yeah. Yeah, well, absolutely. And I'm not sitting here passing judgment on porn in terms of what adults want to watch. But what I know is that in the developing child's brain, for them to uh, become hardwired to seeing those sexual images and, um, and all of the hormonal surges that happen before they are actually like, that is... So it, that's why it, that, that one story was so shocking to me and it was so disturbing because I was like, this poor child, like the magic of childhood was just stolen. Like, how do you get it back? You know, how do you get it back? I mean, to me, it just, I was like, it, it felt, it felt like, um, like almost like if your child had been molested, but yeah. you know, it, like it felt like innocence stolen. That's what right. it felt like to me. On, on one hand, that's every kid today. You know, mm -hmm. so many adolescents have seen breasts, seen penises, you know, seen kissing, seen whatever. And then when they step up for their first experiences, they have all these images in their heads. Mm -hmm. And now when they look at their partner, it's not like, wow, this is so amazing. This is so beautiful. Oh my goodness. It's judgment. It's like, eh, you don't look like the pictures I've seen or the videos I've seen, mm -hmm. right? And so it does steal the glory from it because it was a tremendous, beautiful, impactful experience where, you know, after you had that first exposure, you went home and you thought about it and you remembered it and maybe you fantasized to it and that was your thing. To a normal body, it was incredible. Mm -hmm. And now with porn, like all that's gone. Gosh. So absolutely, yeah. you know, the wait until eight movement, I am a big supporter. Don't give your kid a smartphone until eighth grade or later if you can possibly hold off. Definitely use all the parental monitoring software, right? We do want to keep them from pornography. I am totally a supporter of that. But I will say this, and, um, and I guess I didn't really realize it until we're having this conversation now, when you start to have conversations, productive conversations from a very young age, and you guys have this relationship where you can talk about everything, nothing's off limits, you, you do have that connection. So when I said to when that thing happened with the other second grader, and I said to my kids, um, when you see something that your brain is not ready for, that's something very adult, 
and it involves like naked bodies and it just, it feels a little creepy. It feels a little scary. It's, it's, you're not ready for it. That's actually really unsafe for your brain. And so, um, so we had that conversation and because we had been having productive conversations, they believed me and they trusted me and they took it very seriously. And so they didn't, they were policing themselves when they were around, because there was plenty of kids that had unsupervised technology that they've been around over the years, but they did police themselves. So that's the other thing I want to say to parents is we're all like, they're going to get around every firewall. They're smarter than us with technology. How are we going to protect them? But the truth is, is I think these conversations, communication between you and your child, which you can very much start having through the talk that you just like, you talked about, it. this is a perfect form to have this kind of conversation. You help them to police themselves and to protect Absolutely. themselves. Yeah. yeah, what are you gonna do when some kid pulls out their phone and is like, hey, check this out, and tries to show you porn, right? And if we know that that's a situation we don't want our kids in, then we need to give them an exit strategy. They're, yeah. not, they're not gonna be creative in the moment. They're gonna be overwhelmed. We can't anticipate right. that and be like, oh, well, okay, let's role play that, let's think it through, let's prep you, so that you have some other video and you can be like, nah, check this one out. This one's got acrobats doing like flips and things. This one's super cool, right? Right. right. You really like distract, you know, because when another kid is doing that and saying, hey, check this out, they're looking for that shock factor and for the kid to be like, <gasps> right? And, and for this other kid to be the one in the know, like they're the leader of the pack, right? And then they can be like, oh, look at that so-and-so face, so-and-so so innocent. They don't know. I know I'm the source, right? And if instead they're poo-pooed, like, nah, 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 this is what's really cool, then that's actually going to shut down the behavior. But I mean, that's not our norm. I, I wouldn't think to do that without rehearsing it beforehand and without having something prepped on my phone. Right. Mm -hmm. And so if your kid is in eighth or ninth grade, then you got to give them an exit strategy or they won't have one. So smart. So good. So good. Um, okay. Well, I think that you've been so generous in sharing all your expertise and knowledge. I think this episode is going to help so many people. And, you know, this is a scary topic for many of us. It's, it's something that we're like, Oh, do we have to have a talk? And so just even, this here, letting people know, don't be scared of it. You can lean into it. We've got scripts. We can role play. It will build all kinds of positive communication between you and your kid. It's a, it's a series of ongoing conversations. Like this is going to help a lot of people. So thank you. Well, it's not just for you and your kids, right? Because of course there's tons of benefits that you will get because you will lift your own shame as you practice having these conversations and as you talk with other people, with me, with Randy, with whomever. Uh, so just by shining a light on it, your shame will evaporate. And of mm. course your kids will grow up with a different sense of sexuality, with more openness around it. And that's what they're going to model for their kids, right? Mm. And then for their kids and for their kids. So what we're talking about here is a cultural shift. And so it's bigger than just you and your kid. You are changing this for all the generations that follow. And so if that's not inspiring, like that's super inspiring for me, right? I want to shift Me Too culture to consent culture. I'm really oh excited about that, you know? And so it's not just for my kid, it's for all the kids and it's mm -hmm. for all the generations. Well, in Judaism, we call this tikkun olam. Yes. And, you know, and so I think that you, yes, you just nailed it. And, um, and, oh yes. So the whole like shifting to the consent and the consent culture from the me too culture, tell me, tell everyone about the series you're, you're about to you launch and, and yes. put out there into the world. Yes. Tell us about Fantastic. it. Fantastic. So, um, I am in the middle of doing a whole boatload of interviews I have been gathering experts who can talk about how we can parent differently to prevent the next generation's Me Too stories. And mm -hmm. this is all going to go into the 2018 Talking to Kids About Sex interview series. That's our theme for this year. It's totally free. All you do is go, go to the webpage. Can we provide a link in the show notes? Yes, yeah. absolutely. It's preventingmetooseries.com for anyone who's just listening to this. And you 
put in your name and your email address and it will all get emailed to you and it launches on November 5th. So you'll get you know, two interviews a day for the next week or two and uh, hopefully it will be a whole lot of amazing resources for you. I know I have already learned so much from it, mm -hmm. whether it's just little three minute games that we can play with our kids or total attitude shifts around how do I want to be talking about this? Do I want to have a whole lot of fear or do I want to be really laid back and relaxed and be like, yeah, this might happen, but we'll work through it, right? And so there's just so many pieces that I'm receiving from these experts that I know it's going to be valuable for everybody. Oh my gosh, so good, so good. And this is perfect timing because this is going to air, this is, this, this is airing the end of October. And so everyone can come and sign up and start really learning about this stuff so that we're armed to have these conversations with our kids. It was great. I would love okay. that. All right. Thank you so much again for being here. And until next time, listeners, hope this was helpful. Have a great week. Bye.